Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to your first session. Hope we don't disappoint anybody. Um, like she said, my name is Kaylee Trump, and I'm joined by my colleagues. We're coming from Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, and what we are going to do today is talk to you a little bit about three different phases. Basically, we're going to talk about why we are passionate about what we're doing with inquiry-based learning using Canvas. We're also going to tell you a little bit about how we are doing that right now. And then at the end, we're going to talk about kind of our vision, our next steps here um, as we go through this school year and moving forward. So Pike High School, like you said, it's in Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, if anybody's been there, it's just right inside the 465 circle. Uh, we are a school of about 3,300 students, and we are a minority-majority school. Um, I grabbed these snapshots from the DOE website here, so you can see that um, we're very diverse. We also um, have a large number of our students that are on free and reduced lunches. So this is a really important point to bring because a lot of our students do not currently have technology. So you're going to hear us talk about this and what we're doing to accommodate that right now and still using all of these tools in our courses. So that being said, we are not a one-to-one -one school yet. That is in our plans here in the future. Um, but we do, we are very fortunate to have a $7 million grant from something called YCC or Youth Career Connect. So this allows about 1,300 of our students to be given a laptop that they can use throughout their time in the program and um, obviously in any of their courses. They have special courses that are, a lot of them are STEM based. They have special career counselors and it's a really, really neat program. Um, we adopted Canvas in about January 2014, so it's been a little bit of a slow transition depending on what department you're in and the technology we have. Uh, so we'll, like I said, talk about how we have used it in our different pieces. We did this year start something called the Digital Leadership Cadre, and that's what three of us, um, we are members of. So our goal is basically to um, mentor other teachers and teach them these awesome tools that we are learning and help them bring Canvas into their courses and utilize various tools. So that being said, I want to show this right here. So this is the quadratic formula, and I want to see a show of hands. How many people have honestly done this in their adult lives not helping a child with schoolwork? Anybody? Okay, one. All right, so one person. How many people does this give anxiety to? Anybody? No, a couple people. So a lot of times I get that, that math gives people anxiety or that's so hard, it was so long ago. Um, so this is my big why. As being a math teacher, there are several standards that I'm going to be teaching that the students might not ever have to use. And we know that realistically. They might, but they might not. So what I'm more concerned with is developing their minds, teaching them these really important skills, the critical thinking, the collaboration, um, because those are the things that we want them to take forward with them, not necessarily can they do the quadratic formula. Obviously, that's important to get through our test, but there's a lot more to that. So that is my big push, and that's why I'm doing a lot of these inquiry-based things in my classroom. So that being said, um, I'm going to talk about the math perspective, and then my colleagues will talk about their different classrooms. So uh, right here you will see an example of a project that we did this year in Algebra 2. We took a statistics project that we used to just teach a bunch of, um, here's definitions, and you need to memorize them and take a test. Well, we turned this into a group project. So the students were able to form groups. They came up with their own questions, went out and surveyed uh, different students. They came up with everything they needed. This is where the inquiry part was really, really neat because I wasn't telling them, here's the definition of what this is. They had to come up with that on their own. Um, so you'll see here, this is an example of our P Canvas page that we created for them. So we used a larger module and then all of these linked to individual pages for all the different components that they needed right there inside of Canvas. Now, like I said, we're not a one-to-one -one school. So one other teacher and I, we decided that we would share a laptop cart and we put all of our students on Canvas for this. It was very, very exciting. Um, it was kind of something we've never done before. So we ran into some hiccups and learned a lot about what we'll do next year. But we didn't want to do a traditional stand in front present a poster. So um, that's what our first page looks like. We mainly use the collaborations feature here. The collaborations feature, um, I created groups for all of my students, and they'll talk a little bit about groups, Chad will after this. Um, but because my students are not familiar with using this because they don't have the computers every day, I actually created it for the students. And then within collaborations, I started by creating a Google Slides for them as well. Uh, that way they didn't have to worry about sharing it with me, et cetera. These are some skills that hopefully as they become more comfortable with Canvas and we have the technology every day in our classrooms that they'll be able to do. 
Um, so right here, the students were able to access the slides, get everything done for the presentation, and obviously work at the same time. Uh, one pro tip I did want to point out that we ran into is this is a slight little bug right now, and we've talked to our district people who've been talking to Canvas, who've been talking to Google, and it's getting worked on. But for some reason, if they access their slides through the collaborations, they cannot insert images nor view presentation mode. So it's just a little bug that's being fixed. So if you run into that, if you're starting at the beginning of the school year, have them open it inside of their drive instead of right in collaborations. So it's an easy fix around that we figured out. Uh, so some things that you will see here from the presentation. I didn't tell the students what I needed them, uh, how they were going to present this information. So I had some all on their own create beautiful histograms. Some decided they were going to do it by hand and take a picture and upload it. Um, but as long as they had all the information that we needed, they were able to do whatever they wanted to do. So outside of that, so like I said, that was our big project we did. Um, I try to do activities within all of my different uh, topics that we teach, and I'll make sure I get the laptops on one of those days. This is one example of I'm using an external tool embedded right inside of Canvas. This is called Desmos. Um, if you're not familiar with it in your district, I've definitely passed it along to math teachers. It's a very important tool. And this in and of itself is so inquiry-based in its nature. Um, instead of me telling the students, you need to change the A value to a negative or a fraction, look at the reflections, I'm not telling them those, but they are actually manipulating these values and seeing themselves what happens as they make those manipulations. So I had the students do this in a lesson instead of me teaching it that day. They opened this right up inside of their canvas and this is what they saw. And we worked through this together as class. Um, and they have some cool features on the teacher mode too to be able to control the class's pace, which is really nice. So other external tools, um, just wanted to briefly go over that I have used in my classroom. Um, the big ones are Educreations, Khan Academy, and YouTube. All of those you can create videos or obviously use the videos from the other. And they embed directly into Canvas, and that's what is so nice. They don't have to click on a link, open another browser. It's going to be right there on their page for them. I usually organize my material um, in modules and pages, so I would have whatever I wanted them to learn and my video right there. Educreations, I'm using my iPad at home, and they can hear my voice and see my keystrokes as well. So I'm kind of my own mini Khan Academy. But if it's something that I want to teach them or I think my students are struggling um, with some prerequisite skills or even some supplemental skills, I can put some extra videos on there for those individuals. Um, and then obviously Khan Academy and YouTube a lot are familiar with. CK12 is something I have not used yet. I'm just getting into this, but I'm excited to see how it works. Um, I know it integrates with Canvas, and that's why I was excited to see it. But I'll be able to use that and pull some supplemental examples for my students, whether they need reinforcement, if I have students that are advanced and just want to move forward, or they want to know why something is the way it is, but we haven't gotten to that point yet. Students will be able to access activities that I have up there for them as well. So those are um, my ways I've done that in the math classroom. So I'm going to turn it over to Chad and let him talk about how he's done it in his classroom. Student choice. So we just heard from the keynote about choices and um, having that choice mindset. Uh, I really feel like when the student chooses their project or chooses what they're going to do their project on, that leads to more engagement and a little bit more ownership on the student's part where they actually own that project themselves. Um, and then also while they're choosing uh, their project or what things they need to learn, they are using those critical thinking skills of what is gonna be easiest for me um, and how can I do this project and be most successful. Um, so we're all about choice. Uh, I like to give choice, whether that's choice as to what you're going to focus your project on or, like Kaylee said, how you're going to present that material that you learn. Um, it's all about students taking ownership of that and taking ownership of their learning. Uh, I have learned that the students want to learn what they need to learn only when they need to learn it. Um, I used to do lots of lecture or demonstration, and about half the class was ahead of me, and the other half was like, I'm not paying attention because I'm not there yet. So I stopped doing that, um, and I started using Canvas groups. 
uh, to let the students kind of learn what they needed to learn when they want to learn it. So I use a lot of student choice groups where they can enroll in their own group themselves um, based on what they want to learn. Uh, if they're really good at PowerPoint, that's great. You can go in here and skip the first five, six lessons and because you already know that information, there's no reason for you to repeat learning that information just to satisfy a checkbox. Um, and then uh, I do have some groups that I will create uh, myself that allow the students then to enroll um, in, into the various groups based on what they want to learn. Uh, and then conferences. Love this idea of conference. Um, because it, I am out of the classroom a lot. Uh, my kids will tell you he's hardly ever here. Even when he's here, he doesn't really teach us anything. We just do it ourselves. And I'm like, yes, because I'm giving you the power to make your own class, to like really learn what you want to learn. But I am there in some kind of form or fashion. We can create this conference. If I'm at a conference and I'm out of the building, that doesn't necessarily mean I'm unavailable to you, my students. I can be available for you. Um, we can set up a conference, and I can see your screen, or you can see my screen, and we can go through whatever it is that you want to learn about, or whatever it is that you're struggling with. Um, I used to hear a lot, well, Mr. Bob's not here, so I'm just going to sit here and play some computer games because I can't move on. Well, no, we can. We can use the big blue button, and we can have a conference, and I can answer those questions for you. Um, or we, you can send me a message, and I can respond immediately uh, to help you answer that question. And I'm going to turn it over to Gabby. Sorry. No, you're good. I don't really like having a microphone. I'm kind of loud. Um, but I'm Gabby uh, Bradley. Um, and I teach science um, at Pike High School. So I teach biology and ICP. So something a little different uh, that I do, you know, um, Chad is able to give his students a little more free reign, but we're talking about inquiry and we're talking about Canvas and how we let students um, sort of make their own choices. And so what I implemented this year was module progress. And it's a bit more structured for my students. It allows me to set requirements for them if you've never used it. Um, it allows me to set requirements for them so they're able to sort of explore on their own, but they can't move too fast, um, and you certainly don't want to fall, fall behind. So you can see on the screen, you kind of got two different views here. What the students see um, are the check marks if they've done the activity that I have required them to do. Um, and if they haven't done it, so down here at the bottom with those red circles, if they haven't done something, if they're missing something, um, then they know that they haven't done in a requirement yet. And so I used um, this, and I'll show you the next slide. Um, I used this when we were sort of launching a, a bit of a project. Um, my students were in biology were researching genetic disorders. Um, and I wanted them to pick their own genetic disorder, um, but we used module progress so that I could see where they were in the process of researching their disorder and see their progress as to what their plans were to present their information. So um, a couple of tips here. If you choose uh, to do this, you can make settings to view the item. So kids just have to literally click on the page and then they're done. Um, they have to submit an assignment. So maybe it's not really something uh, that requires a grade. I just want them to submit their blueprint. Um, you can have it set to get a certain score on a quiz or on an assignment. And that was one of the big things as we were studying this leading up to genetic disorders, the quizzes specifically, I wanted them to understand the background information. So, excuse me, I um, set requirements. So you had to get 80% on this quiz in order to move on to the next piece of your project and your assignment. 
And so what it allowed was for those students who were lacking a little bit behind in the information to take their time with it. They had to learn it, because nobody wanted to take the quiz five times. Um, some of them do. <laughs> but, but none of them really want to, okay? Nobody wants to be the kid behind, so it forced them to take their time with the information, but then you also got to see who those overachievers were, those kids who wanted to set their own mastery and say that 80% isn't good enough for me, I'm gonna retake this quiz because I have the opportunity to do so. And I really liked that it gave the kids the options uh, to sort of move through the material at their own pace. One thing that I don't have up here, because I have not explored it yet, um, if your district has allowed it, is they now have a feature called Mastery Paths. Uh, anybody familiar with that? Yeah, y'all are ahead of the game. I need to talk to you people um, when we, before we leave. But what I liked when I was looking at it was that Mastery Paths allowed you to sort of set, you know, here's a lower level activity, here's a higher level activity, and based on how you performed on those activities, this, it would place the student in the next appropriate one. Um, so that's kind of my next step where I'd like to go with using modules and using requirements for my students. Sorry, I'm very nervous. This is a large crowd of adults. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like running out of breath up here. I can talk in front of kids, but you guys, y'all are a tough, tough audience. Okay, I feel better now. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you come from my district, so you're gonna be nice to me. You have to be, yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, the second thing that I, I really hit with in my science classes this year was trying to get my students to own their learning, and not just in the, the traditional way, but there are a ton of resources up here, and I don't know, anybody ever used any of these? Yeah, yeah not just YouTube, because we've all used that one, okay? Flipgrid is new. I've only used it maybe once, okay? But I really liked it, and what I really wanted uh, my students to do, what I liked was that especially if you're trying to flip STEM in any um, form, even if it's a blended learning, like Kaylee said, we're not one-to-one -one yet. So I can't entirely flip my courses. But what I can do is create opportunities for them to just get those quick hitting little pieces of background information and then use the rest of my class time letting the students explore and research and then create whatever the final product is. Um, so we used YouTube quite a bit and if you don't feel comfortable making your own videos, find somebody else's video and play that. There are a ton. And then have the students create something based off of that. And we did um, a lot of that. I used Padlet to launch that same um, biology project that we did to sort of let the kids start to put some ideas out there about what they wanted to do. And so it wasn't me then telling them what to do, it was them putting out an idea and then getting feedback from their students, or from their peers. And it seemed to work really well. And it gave those students who don't like to talk, it gave them a little bit of voice it gave them some choice in how they wanted to interact and what they wanted to do and what they wanted to say. So uh, owning the learning was, was a big one for me this year. Oh man, we're going really fast. Sorry boss, okay. Um, so the what next, I'm gonna go ahead and, and close I guess, sorry everybody. Um, the what next. None of this stuff is, we're not experts by any means. Um, we, we definitely have things that we want to do. And so these are just a few ideas of um, how we want to move, not just the three of us, but the rest of our, our teachers and then hopefully the rest of the district. So one idea we have is to create as you need them modules and courses. And so what we mean by this, are courses where either you have a module set up in your class or maybe your school or your district has an online uh, Canvas course that students can self-enroll in, and these would be like basic things. So this example here is a, um, like a PowerPoint and presentation course. So maybe you just have a kid who does not know how to use PowerPoint whatsoever. And of course there are a ton of resources out there and of course they could ask you all the questions and take up all of your prep time trying to figure out how to put a picture in PowerPoint, but they can do it through this 
self-enrolled course. And it's something that they then choose to do on their own. Um, and they could work through that and you could assist them because it's still all online and it's still your course, okay? So that's one idea that we have. Second thing is we, um, Kaylee mentioned the YCC program. Um, and so YCC has done a great job of building community partners, but we want to continue to, to build that and grow it. And so these are two examples we have. 1150 Academy, they work with coding. And um, some of our students have actually taken internships um, with this company and now work with them. And uh, same thing with 3M. We have uh, mentors who work with our students all of the time, but what we would like to do is be able to go to a place where our students and their mentors can collaborate on Canvas. So we still get the community aspect and those people can still give up their time, but they don't have to actually leave their office to do it. They can give their time right from where they are. They can give their feedback from home uh, to the students, and the students can see it in real time. So the student can be at school or after school, um, and they can do a conference with their mentor. Um, they can share their projects, they can see their work, and they can collaborate. And so that's sort of um, where we wanna go with the community partners. Digital Leadership Cadre, we wanna keep it moving. So we were in the first cohort of uh, digital leaders. We're gonna launch the second round of that. Um, and really what our goal is to, is to continue to equip teachers um, to be able to use these tools in their Canvas class, in their classes and within Canvas. Um, we want to allow all of our teachers and not just us, um, but all of you as well, which is, I'm gonna go ahead and plug. That's uh, the website up there for the Digital Leadership Cadre. I have an awesome blog I wrote up there, so go read it. Um, but we wanna be able to, to get all of our, st all students engaged and create an atmosphere where um, it's not a stage on the stage, but it's a guide on the side sort of thing. And so that is what our hope is with this digital leadership cadre. Don't water the cracks. Right, Megan? Rocks, sorry. Don't water the cracks, don't water the rocks, same thing. Um, the key here is to pick one thing and to get really good at it and to feel comfortable. If you try to go all in with all of this information um, and try to do too much too fast, which I've done, with your inquiry and your STEM, then it's never gonna grow and it's never gonna flourish. And your students will never grow and your students won't flourish either. And that's all of our, that's what we all wanna do. Um, so don't water the rocks, start small, Pick something that you feel really comfortable with and run with it, and then teach that to your student or teach it to another coworker um, so that you can move on to the next thing and become a master at that as well. Sorry. But if you need to um, contact any of us, there are emails and our beautiful pictures. And um, we are all active on Twitter, except for the Mr. Bob. He is not, so don't follow him. <laughs> and are there any questions? Oh, my bad, yes, there you go. You're welcome. Oh yeah, they can see it, and they're like, Miss Ingram, or I was Miss Ingram then. I can't see it, I can't do it. I'm like, well, you, you missed, I mean, they, can, they can't do it, so they can't open up that page. No. Mm-hmm, absolutely. No, but there were other people in the audience who did. Can you people raise your hands again so we can find you? Don't be shy. Mastery paths. I saw your hand. This girl right up front. 
she's three people in front of you. <laughs> it's okay, I'll, we're, we'll talk to her together. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm -mm. You can create your own courses, um, and then it would just be... Little check box. Yeah. When you're creating your course, you can say, enable self-enroll. Self Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Does it depend on the settings that you have? Like, if someone has a course, you can tell them how to do it. Oh, well, I can create my own. If you go into settings, there's a link that you can get, and it yes. chooses the kids. I would say, yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, since we haven't done that yet, I would think, now don't quote me on this, but I would think that when you go in, um, you know how you can enroll people into your class and you can enroll students or teachers, there's also an option, right, to do a, like a TA sort of thing. I would think that they would be that um, because then they'd be able to interact but not grade things or see grades, if I'm correct. Something like that. What's the biggest student challenge you've had in, in doing the, either the flipping or the self-facing? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. I'm not doing Zootopia. Um, the question was, what's the biggest challenge that I've had in trying to flip or do the self-paced module? Um, the biggest challenge was actually um, wanting students to be maybe taking a quiz by a certain time and they were not ready for it. Um, and so I started it probably in the middle of the semester and I should have started it at the very beginning so that they would get used to it um, because they, they want to take the quiz. They don't always want to do the work that comes before it. Um, and so when it's set like that, a requirement, I got a lot of requests early on, Miss Ingram, I can't take the quiz, Miss Ingram, but I'm three activities behind. Okay, I don't. So um, in the beginning, I was doing a lot of like unlocking and changing it, but those kids who want to do it, they kind of started to figure it out, like, oh, I have to do this. And then they realized, oh, this stuff is actually kind of helpful. That was it. Um, I can talk a little bit about more of the flipped classroom. Uh, and I did this, part of being in the digital leadership cadre, we were out half a day for maybe five or six days throughout. So our students weren't going to have us available on those days. So they were really gonna be missing out. So this is something where if I knew that I could schedule my students in a lab, I could put that all on Canvas. So I knew that the accessibility was there and they were doing it in school. So moving forward, when we get one-to-one, -one, that's something that we can do a lot more of right now. It has to be very strategically scheduled and planned just because of accessibility. Because um, we know a lot of our students don't have the accessibility or some might and some might not. Uh, so it's something we're working towards and I'm actually, I'm, put a proposal in, it got denied for this year. We'll see about next year. But um, I requested to teach, so our YCC students all have a laptop. So I requested, well give me an entire group of Algebra two students that are YCC. So then I can utilize the resources we already have. So I'm gonna try to work that again for next year around. So something I could encourage you if you know you have resources to just kind of be creative with working with your district and scheduling. So then that way, um, my goal is to, when I can get those students to kind of work through those bugs and get it ready for other teachers and say, this worked really well and this was a disaster. <laughs> so that's kind of where I'm working on it. So you're talking about the self-paced yeah, self courses? Yeah. <laughs> I don't do self-paced, but. Um, I absolutely still will lecture for maybe like 10, 15 minutes just to make sure that, um, you know, because some kids won't go and watch the videos. They won't have done what they needed to do. Um, or they may not get what I need them to get out of the video. So, you know, they'll watch it just long enough to get it done with. So I still do bring everybody together and we either discuss it or I'm gonna 
tell you this is what you were supposed to get out of that. And I just give them because I do some self-based. I I kind of do a regroup on a daily basis. Like this is where you should be. If you're not here, maybe work a little bit faster. But I know you know you're moving at your own pace. That's the way I set it up. If you're further, that's great. If you need some help, that's when you talk to me. Um, so I don't do, I hardly lecture at all, and it's wonderful. <laughs> but I give a lot of mini lectures. I move around the classroom a lot more than I ever had before. So I do wear comfy shoes on a daily basis just because I am literally walking around the classroom and the kids will stop me and say, I need some assistance over here. Or if I notice something, I might just point it out and say, you might want to look at this again and maybe go through this other module or this other activity and then come back and look at that again. Um, so Most of them are more focused on what they're doing. Uh, and I have had a lot of success with some of those students that are way far ahead. Their friends are not way far ahead. And they are, they become their own teachers. They help each other out um, and say, oh yeah, I struggled with that too. This is what I did um, kind of thing. So that's even better for me because then that's a question that's already been answered by somebody that has been there and done that um, on a more personal level. Uh, I feel like the, the class as a whole is more friendly toward each other and more collaborative with that. Um, honestly, that's why I got the um, laptops instead when we went through our project, because I couldn't have them. I didn't know how to get anything to produce. Um, I mean, they still can use Desmos right on an iPad, and you can do screenshots of it. So you could do it that way. Go ahead and do the Desmos graph on your own and then screenshot it. And if you wanted to submit it, then obviously you could just submit it into Canvas. So that would probably be the only workaround um, I would be able to think of was just to be using Desmos. And they don't have to use that. They could just open up another browser for Desmos. They don't have to use it right within Canvas. Well, thank you so much, everybody. We really appreciate it. <laughs>